much. Uh, thank you for having me. It is a um, poignant honor to be giving this lecture on this course, uh, to this course on the Russian-Ukrainian war for the students of the political science department at um, uh, Black Sea University in Mykolaiv. I hope to offer some insights on peace building, post-conflict justice and reconciliation as uh, was requested, but even more so because I view the lecture as an act of solidarity with the Ukrainians in time of war in this latest news about the power being out only um, increases that sense and um, my uh, sympathy and my uh, support for uh, you, the Ukrainians and their and their cause. Thinking together with Ukrainian brothers and sisters during a time of war provides an inspiration for this talk. Um, but it also provokes its great uh, dilemma. And I offer this talk to a course on uh, war and peace as the author of a book entitled Just and Unjust Peace, An Ethic of Reconciliation. The book is situated in the context of countries seeking to build a just and stable peace after a period of genocide, war, or dictatorship, or some past period of maltreatment of native peoples or slavery. It is there that the book offers an ethic of reconciliation. But the key word there is after. The problem, of course, is that in Ukraine, this after is not here yet. And in the eyes of many, it is nowhere near in sight. Now the focus is on the military struggle. Let me be clear that this is a just military struggle. And Russia invaded Ukraine in a barbaric act, unprovoked and in stark violation of the international law and the just principles that govern behavior between nations. Ukraine uh, rightly defends its freedom from this attack and its freedom not to be subjugated in the way that it was during the Cold War. All the more so, most of the practices that I recommend are ones that Russia is not even remotely interested in undertaking right now, and in which the international community is not capable or willing to bring about acknowledgement, reparations, punishment, and apologies. Right now, justice means liberation from Russian rule. I will be arguing that justice in the form of human rights and the laws of nations uh, what is at stake in the war is an essential component of reconciliation. All of that said, however, I also hold that a true just peace is not merely a military victory, but also the healing of a wide range of other wounds inflicted by past injustices that continue to inhibit right relations among people of a community and between nations. Although measures to redress these other wounds may still be a long way in the future, even decades, Anticipation of them can still guide a people in its struggle. With this promise, I want to set forth my basic principles of political reconciliation and invite your thoughts about their application to Ukraine. The book, Just and Unjust Peace, finds its setting in major global trends of the past generation. The first of these global trends is a wave of endings to dictatorship and civil war. Over 90 countries have become democracies or made strides towards democracy after living under a dictatorship in the early 19, uh, since the early 1970s. Certainly Ukraine becoming independent from the uh, Soviet Union and seeking to establish a democracy of its own is in this category. And think of the popular uprisings against communist regimes in Eastern Europe in 1989. Often great nonviolent movements, several of them led by churches, brought about these revolutions. In Ukraine, such a movement continued in the Maidan Square protest of 2014. In addition, a large number of civil wars were settled after the end of the Cold War in 1989 in places such as Mozambique. Most of them were fought and then came to an end. Uh, some of them were fought and then came to an end after 1989. 
such as in Yugoslavia and Rwanda. So that's the first global trend, is a wave of endings to dictatorship and civil war. The second of these trends is a proliferation of activities and institutions to address injustices of the past in the interest of creating a sustainable peace. These transitions were marked not simply by negotiations, but also by an effort to confront past injustices and to ask, what does justice require in the aftermath of massive injustice? Here are some of the new practices that arose. The International Criminal Court and a host of tribunals for trying war criminals. We've seen over 40 truth commissions. Their purpose is to discover the truth about a period of past injustice. Reparation settlements in countries such as Germany and Chile. Political apologies. Forgiveness. The building of monuments and memorials. And finally, efforts to build reconciliation at the level of civil society. I've been involved in reconciliation work myself in the region of Kashmir and in the region of uh, Central Africa and in the context of uh, the Catholic Church and the sex abuse crisis uh, there. And um, this has inspired my, my writing and has deeply informed what I believe to be possible and not possible in the area of reconciliation. Among these two global trends, the wave of endings and the rise of new institutions to deal with the past, in the debates surrounding all of these practices, what answers have been given to the meaning of the question of justice? Well, the dominant answer to this question is what may be called the liberal peace. It is dominant because it prevails in the leading global institutions, the United Nations, the community of international lawyers, and human rights activists. By liberal, I mean based on the ideas of the Enlightenment, individual rights, human rights, the rule of law, and a central role for judicial prosecution. The International Criminal Court and the criminal uh, tribunals that preceded it are the apex of this thinking. The twin glass towers in The Hague can be seen as a kind of cathedral for this theology. At least one other paradigm for engaging the aftermath of massive violence and injustice, though, has sprung up across the globe in recent years, reconciliation. It often has been espoused by religious leaders in these debates and has its strongest roots in religious traditions though it is not exclusively religious and has secular analogs that facilitate building consensus. The role of religious leaders indeed reflects a third global trend, the resurgence of religion and global politics since the late 1960s. What I have sought to do in my book, Just and Unjust Peace, is to develop reconciliation into an ethic that can be practiced in the realm of politics. How might such an ethic be conceived? Reconciliation is a concept of justice. This is the ethics central claim. It will seem a strange claim to citizens steeped in the modern liberal tradition for whom justice is a matter of rights, fairness, economic equality, and punishment rightly meted out. It is religious traditions that ground the claim strongest. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Christianity is important, uh, particularly for the population in Ukraine, um, as well as Judaism to some extent. And this is these traditions have uh, rooted in them another way of thinking about justice. The Jewish and Christian conception of reconciliation not only describes justice, um, but is also a vision of peace just as the ethic of reconciliation developed here aims to build peace in political orders. Shalom, the Hebrew word for peace, in fact means something much like comprehensive right relationship, prescribing a vision for the entire Jewish community in the Old Testament. 
that involves health and prosperity, economic and political justice, and honesty and moral integrity in relations between persons. Peace then is characterized by justice and is a fruit of justice. This is a point made by Pope Paul VI, Martin Luther King Jr., and jo Johann Galtung, the founder of Peace Studies. Peace is not merely the absence of violence, but also the presence of justice. It is an important insight to keep in mind regarding Ukraine today, especially in light of some of the peace proposals that have been made. My view of justice in the uh, Jewish and Christian traditions is that it means um, comprehensive right relationship, the entirety of human obligations. This would include some obligations that are considered due to others, such as what is their rights, but would it also include other obligations that go beyond rights, such as mercy, forgiveness, generosity, hospitality, and other more care for the poor and other wider obligations. The virtue that animates the process of restoring right relationship is mercy. Mercy in the Jewish and Christian traditions is a far wider, far more restorative virtue than mercy in the Enlightenment tradition, which is primarily a release from justly deserved punishment. Such a concept of mercy complements and indeed quite resembles the biblical concept of saving justice. If reconciliation is a conception of justice, as a conception of justice is rooted in ancient theological text, what form might it take in modern politics? Modern political order is at least ones characterized by human rights, democracy, and limited constitutional government will promote less than the whole range of relationships involved in sedek, the Jewish tradition's view, uh, word for justice, and shalom. They attend primarily to those relationships between citizens and public law. But if political reconciliation promotes less than sedek and shalom, it also involves much more than the mere restoration of rights and institutions. It also involves a wide range of measures aimed at restoring the wide range of wounds that political injustices inflict. Just what are these wounds? The definition of political injustice arises from contemporary transitions themselves. They are violations of the human rights and the laws of war that are spelled out in international conventions. The kinds of laws that Ukraine has been a terrible uh, victim of the violation of. But if these norms define political injustices, they do not describe the multiform and textured ways in which they wound their victims. There are at least six of these wounds. First, the violation of the victim's basic human rights and of states' rights under international law. The first form of woundedness indeed resembles the very definition of a political injustice. But since the legal guarantee of a person's human rights is a key aspect of what he is entitled to vis-a-vis -vis the community of citizens in the state, this violation is one of the forms of woundedness that arises from a political injustice. We can also think of this on the collective level, the violation of the independence of a nation. In the case of Ukraine, the violation of its sovereignty, of the human right um, to life of its civilians and, and of its soldiers, and the attack on its forces stands as a wound. Second, there are the many forms of harm to the victim's person. Among these are death, the death of loved ones, permanent bodily injury, grief, humiliation, trauma, the loss of wealth, property and livelihood, the defilement of one's race, ethnicity, religion, nationality, or gender, a sexual violation, and many other harms. These are obvious in the case of Ukraine. Third is victims' ignorance of the source and circumstances of the political injustices that harm them. There is evidence of people who are wounded in this way. In South Africa, in the context of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there of the 1990s, victims would cry out, if they can just find uh, the bones of my loved ones. They wanted to know what happened. They just wanted to have knowledge of what had happened to their loved ones. 
Fourth, the failure of members of the community to acknowledge victim suffering, either through ignorance or indifference. This uh, question of acknowledgement is also very important. One of the things that is accomplished by the truth commissions is you have a kind of public acknowledgement of uh, victims suffering. And um, prior to that, victims were not recognized and often obscured by the lies of the regime. But through reconciliation processes, victims can receive public acknowledgement and empathy for their suffering. Fifth, there is what I call the standing victory of the perpetrator's political injustice. It is not only harms to the victim's person that political injustices leave behind. Um, but also the sense that there is a, but also an unchallenged, undefeated message of disregard for the victim's dignity, a message that constitutes an additional harm to the victim and to the shared values of the community. I think of in Chile, for instance, even after um, the dictator um, Pinochet had stepped down from power in 1990, and at the, even at the point where he was uh, an elderly and sick old man, um, human rights workers still wanted to see a kind of um, delegitimation of his injustices. When they sought his prosecution, they sought to in my view, bring down what I call the standing victory of his political injustice that needed to be opposed. And then sixth, uh, a wound is the wounded soul of the perpetrator. Deep in several religious and philosophical traditions is the idea that evil injures the soul of the perpetrator. Often this injury will redound in severe psychological damage. This um, idea is it goes back to Plato, but it's also in the uh, in the Christian tradition, the wounded soul of the perpetrator. Because these six forms of wounds are inflicted directly by political injustices, they may be called primary wounds, but they also result in secondary wounds, acts of further injustice and withdrawals of assent from new regimes that arise from the emotions of fear, hatred, resentment, and revenge that emanate from memories of the original injustices themselves. As the experience of countries such as Bosnia, Ireland, and Rwanda attest, these secondary wounds further stunt the project of building just and stable political orders, sometimes for generations. In Ukraine, a long history of Russian domination, but also layers of other conflicts have left their historical wounds. Correspondingly, an ethic of political reconciliation aspires to heal and restore persons and relationships with respect to the range of primary and secondary wounds that political injustices inflict. Reflecting the sense in which the religious traditions view reconciliation um, as action, every bit as much as they view it as principle, it is through practices that the ethic is realized indeed through six multiple and inter interdependent practices. These are building institutions for social justice, acknowledgement, reparations, punishment, apology, and forgiveness. Each manifest reconciliation's core logic of restoration of right relationship and restores a distinct dimension of woundedness. Inasmuch as these practices heal primary wounds, they affect what can be called primary restorations. These restorations can then affect secondary restorations, certain forms of social capital, including an increase in popular trust in the political order, democratic participation, and identification with the nation. It is important to remember that in the political realm, as the experience of the past generation has shown, these restorative practices will always be achieved only in part always hampered by power and unresolved differences over the meaning of justice and limited by their sheer size and complexity. Again, we see in the case of Ukraine that most of these must be envisioned in the future. But as the past generation has also shown, 
The practices are not merely the brainchild of armchair theorists. Each of the six has, in fact, taken place in numerous settings over the past generation, however messily. It is just this predicament that calls for an ethic, one that would be irrelevant if the practices never occurred, and that would be unnecessary if they occurred without difficulty. Let us take a look at the six practices and how they have been undertaken by states and what relevance they might have for Ukraine. First, building just institutions. By this, I mean states built on the rule of law, human rights, and democracy, but also relations between states that respect international law. This too is right relationship, and right relationship is part of reconciliation. This is why I think that fighting a just war can itself be a component of political reconciliation, restoring right relationship in the political order. In fact, some of the key giants and original founders of the just war tradition, such as Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, thought that the purpose of a just war was a just peace, and in essence, restoring right relationship. Second, there is acknowledgement. This addresses the wounds to victims and the lack of recognition. In the past generation, one of the key institutions that has conveyed acknowledgement is the truth commissions. Their basic purpose is to tell the truth, to establish the new state on a footing of truth and prevent dictatorships that function on the basis of lies. So they look at the past period of injustices and seek to uh, compile a report that tells the truth about what happened. But there's also a more personal sense to them. It is not just forensic truth, the kind of truth that a lawyer would tell, but healing truth that they many seek to tell. In the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there is a sense that people are healed by, be, by being given the opportunity to speak in front of a national audience. Sometimes they testify in ways that are surrounded by loved ones, by the affirmation of the audience and by the commissioners themselves. This also has a large effect for the political order. It invalidates the principles that the new order is based upon. This sense of personalism, as I call it, was particularly reflected in Guatemala, where the Catholic Church formed its own truth commission, the Recovery of Historical Memory Commission. One of the things that it did was to send out volunteers to villages where they would take the testimony of people whose loved ones had died but they would also seek to provide them counseling, to have a ceremony of remembrance, and often to construct a memorial that would um, serve to remember those who had died. There was a personal sense of empathy conveyed. On a more collective level, museums and monuments can remember unjust suffering. In the United States, our Vietnam War, Vietnam War Memorial contains the memory, the, the names of all the soldiers who died in Vietnam, giving them a kind of personal um, significance. So obviously this is um, a premature discussion for Ukraine, but would there be forms of memorial? Would there be forms that forums that tell the truth about the past injustices that convey acknowledgement, public empathy for people who have suffered and suffered the loss of loved ones? Would there be any in, anyone in Russia who might participate in some way? Is this that perhaps this is a, is a large stretch, but something to think about uh, for the future? Third, there is the practice of reparations. Reparations place material commitments behind words. The leader in reparations is Germany, following the Nazi. Uh, crimes. In the Luxembourg Agreement of 1952, Germany um, uh, bequeathed to Israel one of the largest reparations payments um, ever given. And since that time, um, since the Nazi crimes, Germany has paid out some $70 billion in reparations. In more recent years, both Argentina and Chile have had 
generous and robust reparation schemes for people who have suffered torture and other war crimes under uh, their dictatorships. Post-transition governments in Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary have had um, uh, lively discussions about reparations, especially with the question of uh, restoring property that was seized by communist regimes. Reparations now have a strong standing in international law. Now, in most of these cases, reparations have required a change in regime. Um, the Nazis obviously had to be defeated. The reparations took place under the Federal Republic. And we obviously don't have that in Russia today. There is talk of international assistance and rebuilding, but this is different from reparations that express justice. Obviously, they're not likely to happen under the Putin regime. But Ukraine is right to express the call for reparations and the desire for reparations as part of a just peace. Fourth is the practice of political apologies. Interestingly, there has been a vast growth of political apologies around the world since the 1990s. Now there have been over 600 as, uh, in the forms of some documentation. A political apology is an apology issued by usually by the leader of the state or another organization such as a church for crimes that were committed in the name of that state, in the name of that church, or whatever the organization is. For instance, since the 1970s, German chancellors and presidents have issued public apologies for the crimes of the Nazis and have done so many time, times. Some of the South African leaders during apartheid also apologized. The United States has apologized to uh, Japanese citizens who were interned in World War II and to victims of what were called the Tuskegee experiments, experiments regarding the disease of syphilis um, perpetrated upon uh, African Americans without their knowledge. Apologies sometimes succeed, but they're not always well received. In Japan, for instance, in the 1990s, certain prime ministers voiced apologies for uh, Japanese war crimes during World War II, but there was a strong and popular backlash among conservative forces who felt that Japan was primarily a victim during World War II and shouldn't be apologizing. Again, uh, apologies are not likely to be forthcoming under Putin, but they can be incorporated into Ukraine's expression of what a just peace would involve. We can begin to talk about them, anticipate them, envision them, and make them part of the aims of Ukraine. Fifth is the practice of punishment. This has also arisen over the past several decades. In the 1990s, we saw international tribunals in Yugoslavia and Rwanda and these revived the precedent of the Nuremberg trials after World War II, which tried individuals for war crimes. They then evolved into the International Criminal Court, a standing international court for trying individuals. Now, so far, there, there have been much more success in trying individuals in the international tribunals in Yugoslavia and Rwanda than in the ICC. The ICC has the problem of uh, the difficulty of arresting criminals. It doesn't have the enforcement power and bringing them to, to trial. So far, there have been very few convictions in the 20 years of its um, existence. Um, there's also a big problem with arbitrariness. The United States, Russia, India, and China are not members. Nevertheless, it is an effort to bring judicial punishment to crimes and to defeat the standing victory of injustice and to express the values of the international community and try to uphold them in cases where they're violated. Now, there are some talks of trials for Russian leaders. Obviously, we don't have the capacity to bring that about right now. This is very embryonic and incipient. But again, I believe it is part of the just aims of Ukraine to include 
a punishment for war crimes, prosecution for war crimes um, in its aims. Finally, the, the sixth one is a little bit more surprising, uh, but I also discuss it in, in the book. It is forgiveness. Now, of the practices, this is the one with the greatest difference between a religious and a secular ethic. This can be seen in the transitional justice community, the network of officials, activists, and scholars involved in these kinds of efforts of justice for the past that I've been talking about. They, and even some scholars who adopt the paradigm of reconciliation in their thinking, ignore or criticize forgiveness. We see warring paradigms in sites of transitional justice. In South Africa, for instance, you had this kind of debate, heavy debate between the advocates of the liberal peace, it was all about human rights and law and prosecution, and reconciliation, which is often associated with religion. And the most prominent advocates of reconciliation actually talked about forgiveness. Archbishop Tutu, who chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, wrote a book called No Future Without Forgiveness. And he thought forgiveness should be part of the peace. Nelson Mandela, the um, leader of South Africa, who had been jailed for 26 years, made forgiveness a part of his message um, after apartheid. Now, there are reasons and good reasons why forgiveness is ignored or criticized. It is said that it oppresses or abuses victims. It places burdens on them, especially when they are pressured to forgive. It is said that it forgoes the true demands of justice, which are punishment and other things. It is also said that they are too religious and don't really belong in politics. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is a victim's willed act to release perpetrators of the moral debt of their wrong and to exercise a will towards their moral restoration and to restore right relationship. Forgiveness is not a right. It is not something owed to the perpetrator. It is a gift. It is different from the other six practices in this sense, which all fulfill a right. That may account for why it is ignored. Forgiveness is also different than full reconciliation. It is a multi-party process that also requires apology and repentance from the perpetrator. There can also be good reasons why a victim might forgive and not reconcile. They may uh, regard themselves as subject to abuse or um, maltreatment of different sorts. So forgiveness is not something that is isolated alone, but takes place with reparations, apologies, punishment, and so forth. There are secular grounds for forgiveness. It helps to restore relationship and build a sustainable peace, though it is difficult also to think about forgiveness with respect to mass atrocities. It is religious traditions which give them a greater status. In the New Testament, for instance, um, Jesus teaches forgiveness um, in strong terms, and but associates it with his own forgiveness of humanity and it becomes more possible in that a person is kind of drawn into um, God's act of forgiveness of the world. Does forgiveness actually take place in the political order? Um, after I published my book, Just and Unjust Peace, in 2012, it was reviewed in the New Republic, a prominent magazine in America, by a critic named Barry Gouin. He liked the book, but he was skeptical of forgiveness. Here's what he said. Philpott is describing saintly behavior, idealism raised to its highest level. And here is the problem. Saints may be necessary, but they cannot serve as examples for others to follow. They stand out from the rest of humanity by their readiness to sacrifice themselves for their convictions. They dwell beyond normal society, exploding institutions for the greater good as they understand it. To adopt Philpott's good intentions at their warmest, without the skepticism of realist tough-mindedness, can produce fat fanaticism and self-destruction. Similarly, in the world of scholars, activists, and intellectuals who work for transitional justice, few speak of forgiveness. Um, well, this criticism uh, motivated me to um, go to Uganda, and I conducted a study of forgiveness 
with a question in mind, do people actually forgive? Um, I surveyed 640 people who had lived through regions, five regions of war and conflict. And um, the results were favor for, favor for and practice of forgiveness. They, these proved remarkably common. The question measured attitudes towards forgiveness by asking respondents whether they agreed to the statement. It is good for victims to practice forgiveness in the aftermath of violence, to which 86% agreed. It also turns out that 68% said that they had actually personally forgiven their perpetrator. Many other questions surround forgiveness, and we could we could talk about it. But I see it as one in uh, a broad portfolio of practices that also include fighting a just war, building just institutions, acknowledgement, reparations, apology, punishment, and so forth. Reconciliation is a whole holistic uh, enterprise composed of multiple practices, all of which um, restore different wounds in different ways. So reconciliation um, means uh, restoration of right relationship. It is equivalent to the concept of justice that is found in religious traditions. In my book, I located it in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Although I believe it can also be expressed in secular terms and it can thus build bridges in secular forums such as political institutions, the, the UN, and so forth. Um, it includes things that the liberal peace would include, such as human rights, the rule of law, and so forth. But it is broader, looking also at the need for empathy, the need for healing, the need for uh, living together again, um, the need for apology, the need for addressing wounds of a wider range than the rule of law alone or human rights alone can address. So reconciliation then depends, uh, involves these six practices. I don't, it sounds a little bit utopian to say six practices. I don't envision, you know, reconciliation may happen decades into the future. The six practices may occur such that some occur, but others don't. One occurs and, another, and others don't. And they occur in partial degrees, always with problems and dilemmas and controversies. But nevertheless, by thinking of the ethic holistically, we can begin to see some of the ways in which politics might creatively address some, some of the wounds left by massive injustices, including the kinds that uh, Ukraine is experiencing today. Thank you very much, and I welcome questions and reactions.